Thank you very much, uh, Maria, not only for this introduction, but um, for this absolutely magnificent collaboration. We, um, uh, we're really grateful. And in a sense, collaborations like that, and I think, you know, what, what you mentioned almost in a passing that uh, Buck has uh, produced, uh, co-produced uh, an investigation uh, needs to be kind of um, uh, emphasized that, that in fact, and to a certain extent would answer some of the issues and questions we are raising here. What is the relationship between truth practices, uh, artistic one and curatorial one? Um, this exhibition has been for forensic architecture an opportunity um, to fund and produce an investigation. It was presented in court and Christina would uh, in fact um, discuss it later. So thank you, uh, Maria, thank you, uh, Vitzke, thank you, Ine and Nick, uh, for really what has been a, a very unique experience uh, for us. And um, assuming you have seen something of the exhibition, I will start somehow without slides and um, try to think aloud, perhaps, about um, a particular problem uh, that uh, we're facing uh, as an organization today in, in, in the way that we think about our own practice. And to a certain extent, I think that the way in which we're dealing with some conceptual problems to do with um, intersection of uh, aesthetic practices, politics, science, activism, law, reflect something of the debates that, that, that exist here. The question is, really for us, why today an organization like Forensic Architecture, not, not that it could exist, I think it, it might have existed in different forms in different times, but what is it that kind of uh, puts us right now in, um, uh, in, in, in a way that somehow overwhelms us uh, with interest coming from the art world, from journalism, and from law? Right? And in all those fields, um, we feel a certain appetite uh, for, for a kind of um, uh, perhaps a, a, a position and that we ourselves need to be, to, to understand um, uh, and to reflect upon in relation to our own work. Uh, so um, I, think, I think you know by now and I think you've seen forensic architecture as a group now we're about fluctuating around 20 practitioners. Uh, architects maybe are the biggest group, but there are artists uh, in it, mainly filmmakers. Uh, there is um, heritage uh, specialists and archaeologists. Uh, there are a couple of journalists, um, lawyers. Um, I'm probably forgetting some coders. Um, and um, I think everyone that is there understands our practice really to be between aesthetic practices and an intervention. It's not kind of by chance that, that this um, uh, interest or in the, an exhibition like in a place like that uh, could take place. But we are asking ourselves, um, and I think many of us are facing with the same kind of issue. I think many of us, if not all of us, come from different backgrounds in political criticism, um, in political activism, broadly speaking, although different shades of left-wing activism, of the kind that perhaps several years ago would have been content to hear things like the law and you want to reach for your gun, um, expertise and you want to pick up a five kilo hammer, um, normative, frameworks like human rights, etc. I myself just about less than eight years ago published a big critique of human rights in a book called The Least of All Possible Evils. All of the sudden standing and affirming a certain positive relation to truth, right? Um, and obviously there is, there is an issue. What, what has happened politically, technologically, um, perhaps in um, a reorientation of artistic and aesthetic practices 
that make us actually kind of accept our position in relation uh, to those um, to to those terms. So I think um, there's obviously you know the, one can speak about those issues in different ways, and I think a good entry point into it is to speak just like. Here, there's a program called Non-Fascist Living. In a certain um, antagonism or opposition to um, a shifting in the relation to truth, um, in to truth practices in the political landscape. So it's, it's not that it's anything new, but it's easier for us to articulate our position in relation to what is now broadly called post-truth um, environment. And of course, much is made of the popular right insurgency against truth. And you know the example from Eastern Europe, from the US, from the UK, from Israel, Palestine, etc. Um, so a, a kind of an attack on what is called traditional mainstream channels of communications, account, accountability, practice sources of reporting, and in particular, and I'll, I'll go back to that, practices of verification. So this uh, post-truth politics, as it, uh, people call it now, post-truth era, is an assertion of an ideological construction by which politicians, mainly politicians, but not only, try to compel somebody to believe and act regardless of evidence, and sometimes despite of evidence. So um, the attack of, on evidence is, not, is an attack on the entire institution that support evidence. Universities, expertise, think, tank more, think tanks more or less, uh, um, international monitoring um, groups uh, for economic growth, etc. I mean, even very, very mainstream institutions that were seen as somehow guardians um, of truth. Um, so this, in a sense, what, what we are experiencing is a kind of propaganda, right? Propaganda in a sense of uh, trying to kind of to compel and project uh, a certain um, political position rhetorically, but one that does not aim to convince, right? So, so the new kind of propaganda is not to say um, the Eastern Bloc or equality is better than freedom, as in the Cold War, uh, you know, kind of just to dummy down kind of that debate, or this is better than that, but to remove the kind of the capacity to even measure and evaluate truth and not to know anymore what is the matrix by which the kind of the our common perception of the world uh, is articulated uh, around uh, in with and and when you are able to do that to issues such as climate change human rights violation historical or present genocide when you when you void the capacity to establish facts as the basis of decision, power, i.e. the power of that uh, of those new populist group, is in asserting it uh, emotionally, as kind of like um, effectively appealing to affect uh, within that um, political field. And these are not, uh, so, so everything become a mere opinion at the eyes of the beholder, and taking that away, taking away the capacity to orient within the world in which, in fact, facts proliferate, signal proliferate, image proliferates, opinion proliferate, taking away the capacity to orient allows a certain perpetration and perpetuation of uh, forms of domination and violence. So, in a sense, um, the culture of post-truth is not really about a field of representation. I, it is not simply about describing phenomena or misdescribing phenomena, but it's about a violence that is continuously perpetrated 
uh, in which terror is enabled. So the, if um, postural is a kind of entangled phenomena that on the one hand voids the capacity to navigate around fact, on the other hand, it is articulated with um, a certain culture of terror and targeting, and in particular, and the one that we want to emphasize today, uh, against migrants along the entire trajectory of migration, before they arrive in Europe, when people are uh, so on the way uh, in the Mediterranean, through a certain uh, practices of abandonment, both legal practice of abandonment and physical ones, um, and in the Aegean or the Mediterranean, and then after that, a sort of incitement and targeting of migrants when uh, they're here. So we're not speaking here in a post-truth about um, a, a, a certain rhetorical or a certain field, it's purely a field of representation, but a form of violence, attack against people and things, and also against the evidence that any violence has taken place at all as a continuation, as a condition of perpetration. Um, now, this seems to be somehow new, at least um, in the political culture of uh, Europe and perhaps the US. But I think that many of us that have worked in a field of um, uh, in anti-colonial struggles, let's say in Palestine, against Israeli form of domination of Palestinians within Palestine, the, uh, Palestine in complete, both the uh, in, in its 48 and 67 borders, uh, and, and others understand that that condition of violence, that state violence being always those two things, violence against people and things, and violence against the evidence that those that, that violence has taken place, need to be understood, and we need to look at the technologies in which violence is perpetrated, specifically in order to understand and unpack that relation. Violence, the total violence that we are seeing as part of the contemporary fields of conflict and the colonial present, is one that is aiming also at the instrument of measure. So imagine an earthquake that is so uh, powerful, that does not only erase buildings, crack roads, and flatten cities, but it has destroyed the very instrument that would measure the strength of this earthquake, right? And I think that is the kind of erasure of, uh, of violence that uh, we are talking about. So, um, And what is and how does it operate? And I think when we understand how it operates, how that destruction of the instruments of measure, a violence that is so total and so severe that destroy the instrument that could measure it, um, we need to look at practices of verification. So we need to understand a certain relation to the truth that is not really a kind of a truth as in a sense of any atemporal given that need to be um, throughout history slowly unpacked, something, a kind of a theological, fundamental, an artifact, a revelation, a, revelation, a temporal belief, but to look at it, so not at veritas, as the notion of um, the noun of truth, but verification as a verb, the practice, truth practices. And in fact, the only thing that one might accept with the definition of, um, um, of the, the, the very definition of the post-truth era is that it puts, by, by saying the prefix post, puts truth on a kind of an historical trajectory. You would say, well, there was a truth era, now there's a post-truth era, and that is, there is a kind of a historical a, a change in relation to it. 
And I think this is something that is important to understand when we think about practices of verification. Truth that is produced now in a certain new entanglement relation between the visible or sensible world, images, sounds, whatever enter into our senses, prosthetic senses, such as, such as machine vision, perhaps in the era of AI, uh, how truth or facts are produced or verified, what is the danger with them and what is the possibility of inhabiting a very different period of understanding of truth and verification. And therefore, we need to understand the attack on truth as an attack, as not that which puts one truth against another, but attack the very principle of verification. How do you attack verification? You attack the organization initially that can provide and assert certain facts. You attack the universities as elitist. You attack... Um, the, if it is in a field of conflict, you attack the NGOs as always already existing within a, a sort of a, a partial political position in relation to, to atrocities, or to, 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 sorry, to a particular political uh, development. And you attack personally, ad hominem, the people that are seeing themselves as part of the Part of the activism is truth production. I, you know, like human rights organization that reports and uh, or environmental organization that provide uh, these reports. I know myself that uh, whenever, uh, so I think you know that uh, the origin of at least of my work comes from political activism in Israel Palestine, and and whenever there is uh, any statement that either myself or forensic architecture would put on Israel-Palestine, they would point their finger and would say, well, you know, you support BDS or you sign this and this petition. Uh, therefore, you know, you cannot even participate within the kind of the field of truth production. I, it is not really an argument always on facts, an alternative fact or, an, or, or a mistake or another interpretation of the facts that we assemble and construct, but an attack on the possibility of speech. So there is no argument. There is never an argument between one and a denying force, be it as police or a military, because what they would do is actually not allow you to enter at all into the debate. Uh, and that is articulated, again, either on a political position or increasingly, and as, as you would see, based on the fact that you guys are only artists. If you are artists, if you have shown, and to that extent, the fact that you know, the Golden Dawn investigation has been co-produced by Buck, uh, the fact that this uh, investigation that I'll speak about later, the NSU investigation uh, in Germany has been shown in Documenta, is seen already as, a, as um, to invalidate one's capacity to speak at all uh, the truth. Uh, and um, so we are thinking that we need to, in fact, think again about truth production. And rather than positioning as in a kind of the instinctive critical stance of um, scholars and artists and intellectual against um, authority and truth, against expertise, we need to think about a different way of rewiring that problem. So whereas artist kind of like traditional relation to technology, not always, but very often is um, to look at its Problems to look at the kind of its um, at the repression that is already embedded within it, uh, kind of like um, uncover its military history uh, and things like that. What we want to do is create a different diagram between different institutions of different nature: legal institutions, political institutions, juridical institutions, art institutions, such as the gallery and the museum, uh, and cultural one. 
simply realign their relation uh, in a way that uh, create a different diagram by which one could look at a certain what is what are the practices what are the aesthetic practices political juridical activistic practices of truth production today and how do we need to with the same diagram that we have not put them perhaps in opposition to each other but rewire them in a different way the the lab the scientific lab the artist studio the university uh, the activist group uh, institutions that are somehow some of them are kind of solid with very disciplinary rigor and some problematic history others that are floating how verification arrived precisely through the meshing of perspective how verification arouse, arouses not in a perspectival view of a single expert whose authority is actually kind of there to render valid particular facts but precisely through a kind of a intense sometimes insane multiple the meshing of multiple perspectives uh, that would otherwise seem uh, incompatible uh, through the situated knowledges uh, through uh, an assembly of a kind of a multitude and a creation of verification as the task of the common right so if we think and this is something i've i think i've ended my presentation in ecf about a kind of a certain proposition that we need to think of the common and you know we know a common spatial commons this area that is belong to the commune or we know about resources how we think about the common in terms of the water and air or how we think about it in terms of data or how we fight for data uh, that is harvested from us privately continuously to enter into the common the process of verification the idea of enmeshing the multiple perspectives together in a creation of uh, an elastic, continuously shifting, but still concept of the world on which we step, in which we act, a certain basic agreement that can hold us together is essential. Right? And to think about that and mashing, not only as the putting together of discipline, but as the creation of uh, a political organization that exists across borders between different individual and organizations that are otherwise incompatible. Right? And I think that's the challenge for us uh, today, to say that the production of uh, particular practices, truth practices, of verification that needs technology, that needs representation, that needs interpretation, that needs text, that needs new um, harvesting of testimonial technique, of new types of vision, um, together creates a very unlikely common, but very essential, a certain metapolitical condition on which politics um, only could operate while we have created that, that ground, that common ground. It does not mean that this is the end of the game. It does not mean that that truth is sacred or permanent. It means that it's a diagram of a, of a momentary relation between multiple practices and communities and organizations. And I think that this is a certain, um, what is essential in that, is a kind of a, also a reorientation of uh, aesthetic practices um, to be able to work laterally in, in this way. Um, in, the, in the ECF lecture, I think I've ended with saying this is a kind of a new 16th century, you no? Know? But I think it's too simple. Uh, a 16th century in terms of like artists and uh, scientists working together as a kind of as a, in a common project of describing the world. Um, around them. Um, so here is basically the kind of the contours uh, of the proposition. Verification as a verb, verification as a practice, verification as a realignment of aesthetic practices with scientific and different institutional uh, uh, organizations against a violence 
the violence of trying to destroy it. Hey, that's the diagram that holds us together. That's the ground on which we operate. The violence of taking verification away is breaking away of verification in that term that I um, described now, of the, the multiplicity of in, incompatible, is um, uh, this is not only an attack of representation of truth, but violence itself, the condition of violence. If we want to um, maintain the ground against the onslaught of this popular regime, perhaps fascist, new fascism, as Maria is proposing, or Bach is proposing here, um, we need to find new ways to, um, of witnessing data and instrument of measure, new modes of processing, algorithmic uh, or forms of logic and uh, uh, argumentation, and also new modes of transmission, whether it is an um, um, understanding of big data, citizen journalism, or the dissemination or and proliferation of fact based verifications uh, practices uh, in places like uh, like here this is why i'm extremely i'm extremely um, proud that an investigation that that uh, an artistic place together with a court in greece together with a group of um, led by christina of of uh, of young researchers filmmakers and and that could together Right, that diagram, courtroom in Greece, a place in uh, an artistic uh, cultural center in, uh, in Utrecht, uh, could be aligned in that kind of diagram uh, and, and produce real world effects as, uh, as we would see. Okay, so this is me kind of just like thinking aloud. So this is, I think, why today that diagram could happen because precisely of those challenges of, of um, of um, the enemy articulating itself as an attack on the common of verification, on the common ground of verification, uh, the and the new technologies that allow us to think testimony, the documentary, vision, processing and presentation in a different way, that at least into that world, an organization like us could, could actually think itself into being uh, and try to articulate uh, the challenges uh, in this way. So how to link you know, our archaeologist with the coder, with the architect and the filmmaker, even within the office, is a kind of a, a diagram. Uh, this is very interesting. If you'd come and visit, please arrange it uh, before. I think uh, you might enjoy. So we are engaged in forensics, but in a sense, our understanding of forensics is that which um, traditionally is that which been exercised by the state. Forensics is the art of the state. Forensics is what police forces, secret services, all those people that eavesdrop on us, survey us, check our uh, social media account, etc., are doing. The difference is that counter forensics is not simply taking, it's not like the people have raided the lab, the police lab, and now we can use it for our own device. It's not like, you know, like the guerrilla forces have hijacked a tank and now can go widely with it. It's a completely different practice because the, the way in which verification operate in the social cloud uh, is very different than the way in which police establish forensic. I'll give you just a very simple example. There's a court here not far away in The Hague called the International Criminal Court uh, into which both Christina and I are now uh, advisors. So, i.e., um, they are interested somehow in our quasi-artistic like forms of truth production. No? So we were invited as... as um, uh, uh, to the advisory board on new types of evidence there. And what we, one thing that we could see, very interestingly, is that traditionally legal thought around evidence is very object-based. What does it mean? Let's say this glass with water has had a, 
particular role in a in a trial in a, in a in a case in a murder, let's say something like that. Um, it, when it becomes evidence, it would need to be locked in some kind of safe or drawer with a with a key. Every movement of it would have to be recorded. This is called chain of custody. Chain of custody is object relation, object based evidence practice, right? When this is presented, everyone has ever touched it, seen it, everyone that had the key would have to be registered, etc. When you're talking about verification practices in the open, about war crimes in Palestine or in Syria, where you cannot really trace every mobile phone that has been, the practice of, um, of uh, establishing something as an evidence is much more relational. Like, how many other evidence support that evidence? So none of those videos could be traced. You cannot get the mobile phone. I, again, a crime that will be done here and is captured on one of yours mobile phone, that mobile phone will have to be locked. The original chip or you know, storage would have to be there. Um, in the open, that does not exist. We need to create practices of verification that are network-based, cloud-based, in which um, evidence support uh, other forms uh, of evidence. So we're talking now, even though that is becoming now, is being captured now by an institution like the ICC, we're talking about different processes, not simply the same like forensics in the hand of the people. We're talking about that. Um, i give you another uh, example. Forensics, the whole process of forensics is the closest in the contemporary context of all contemporary practices to um, kind of like basic, fundamental, theological, religious practices. Um, why is that? Let's say a murder has taken place. The murder sanctifies the place, the sacred being that which is excluded from common use. Murder has happened, the state would come and put a cordon, would mark out the space of the sacred. Only if you are a priest of that state institution, it could be verified by an FBI card or whatever is the equivalent here, you could enter into that sacred zone. And sometimes you would enter it with very funny clothes of some kind of bishop uh, white cloth, uh, and you can touch things. The entire then, the evidence would be taken into a lab, another place of uh, sacredness in which the protocols of science would not allow the contamination of evidence, of course, very important, uh, to take place. And the very protocols uh, of uh, processing would, would take place. And then the sacred of all sacred, this courtroom in which the practices of truth production decision based on a certain transcendent relation of the judge to uh, those that argue and, and the evidence, right? Counter forensics has none of those capacities. Counter forensics cannot enter into that place of the sacred. Counter forensic needs to profane, now to use a kind of, you know, Agamben's formulation uh, in his book, Profanation, to profane that place of the sacred. We'd either need to sneak in and steal something from it, because, of course, when the alleged murder or crime is a state crime, and the state controls the cordon, of course they wouldn't allow anyone else that is not, that would investigate them to do that properly. So you have that cordon being put around, and those undertaking counter-forensics kept out only that sometimes something leaks from inside the sacred zone outside. Somebody from those priests of truth inside that zone of the sacred would kind of like upload something online. Or maybe there are people, maybe the crime scene is so big that many people are there recording stuff and, and, and leaking it. It's the same process of leaking, whether it is a leaking as in taking information beyond the threshold uh, of the state cordon. Of course, for forensic practices, the crime scene is always small. For counter-forensic practices, 
This crime zone, if this is a state killing, and we will show you cases like that, is part of a whole network of relations that are much, and the crime is happening elsewhere, in boardrooms, in communications between offices. It is not confined into the small part. It's always bigger. The, 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 the attempt of counsel forensics is always to start from the crime zone and navigate outwards and outwards and link various uh, places together. Of course, our labs are no match for the state forensic lab with their DNA technology, et cetera, et cetera, and all the other things that they might or might not have. We need to produce it differently. This is why aesthetic practitioners are those looking at images when images proliferate. And the multidisciplinarity and somehow wild process of production um, is is um, that is articulated in a counter forensic process is uh, needs to be very different to the state process and then we are not allowed even into the court as I will show you in that case on which I'm standing uh, because the state does not want to discuss state crimes and then you need to find other forums and then the understanding of forensics as the art of the forum that which derives from the Latin origin forensis that which belongs to the forum, we need to understand it again in a traditional sense of, um, um, in, in a way it has been used, that which belongs to the public domain, that which belongs to the public, the forum as the place of the public, making uh, the evidence, giving it back and opening it to the public rather than confining it within the institutional, uh, within the institutions of, um, uh, bureaucratized uh, justice. And if you think there are contradictions what I say, it's because there are. Uh, because we, and we need to uh, navigate them continuously. So I don't know, I think I've gone for quite a, uh, a while, no? Uh, so uh, I, I intended to give a lecture, but uh, now I, uh, I will just have to kind of um, do a sort of transition to uh, not show you things that I plan to do. This what sort of happened to me often. I just get carried away. But I did want to show you um, along the trajectory, at least two points along the trajectory uh, of migration. Uh, this is a work that uh, Forensic Architecture has done with an affiliate group to ours called Forensic Oceanography. I think this piece is, is on show here, right, Maria? The Juventa? Okay, so you, you would see more, but here is a moment from it and a kind of claim counterclaim uh, moment that happens. The violence does not begin at sea, but the sea has been weaponized um, fundamentally uh, these days um, to um, become a sort of a deadly frontier for migrants. That's been the work of Charles Heller and Lorenzo Pisani for many years uh, through the forensic oceanography platform. Together we came to um, disprove some of those uh, claims. So effectively, very practically, uh, what our your uh, European masters are doing now at sea is to take away, it's a double act. On the one hand, anyone that rescues migrant is being criminalized and taken outside of that zone of operation so that people either would drown or if they're rescued, that they'll be rescued, uh, let's say, sub-Saharan migrants doing the Mediterranean crossing to Italy or Spain um, would be taken mainly by the Libyan Coast Guard and brought back to Libya to what effectively, in all effect, are concentration camps. Contemporary concern, finance, and, 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 and in fact, produced by, by Europe. Uh, in there in order to avoid uh, having people here. So two acts, one pushing the and, and stalking the um, uh, Libyan Coast Guard on the one and on the other hand taking away the rescuers. Taking away the rescuers requires some kind of evidence that they are criminals. So this is an example of that, uh, a slide uh, of the uh, Italian prosecutor claiming um, 
the proof for the crime, and if they're right, they might, be, uh, they might have a point. Uh, a German NGO called Jungen Rettet is uh, rescuing people in the Mediterranean. Uh, they have a boat called the Juventa. Uh, these are the activists. And they say that after a successful operation where those migrants have been taken to the Juventa boat and brought to Europe, those activists are dragging the, the boat with which they've arrived and got stranded in the middle of the Mediterranean back to Libya so they could be used again, i.e. that they are colluding with people smugglers and are themselves people smugglers, right? I mean, if that would have been true, I, I don't know that I accept it, but there is some difficulty. There is some explanation people need to do. So they say they drag that boat towards the Libyan territory. Here is the signature of the Italian prosecutor. How the hell do they know that this boat is being dragged towards Libya? I mean, why? What, 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 where is Libya in this, in this picture? I mean, they could say anything on anything, right? Only that there is. And if you look, and we, we started to, to look at this bit of footage so intensely um, and finding the only directional thing within it are the waves. So this is a kind of like motion tracking of the waves, verifying that. So computer vision sees the direction of the waves, an architect builds a model of the water, as I'm sure most of you do and, and know how to do. It's not a very difficult thing uh, in order to see whether the, um, the uh, kind of the, the liquid model of the sea uh, would work. And then effectively what you do is go to open sources and ask what was the direction of wind and waves on that particular day. Well, it so happened that the waves are going towards the north in that thing and that the boat is dragging the, uh, the, the Juventa boat, the, the German NGO boat, is dragging the, uh, the, these boats um, away from the Libyan coast. So you'd say that's, you know, open and shut case, right? Only that the Juventa is still, this material is going to be presented in court uh, very soon, in Strasbourg, in fact, and um, we're gonna see uh, what is going to happen. I mean, there's just somehow too much at stake. I'm gonna skip that and move into what you see here. Can I? Hold it like that and walk. So maybe rather than, I mean, basically what you see here is a plan, a one-to-one -one plan of the slide that you see here. I think maybe many of you know the, um, the case that forensic architecture was commissioned by the People's Tribunal Unraveling the NSU Complex in Germany to undertake. Uh, a group of activists and members of bereaved families of a spree of neo-Nazi killing in the first decade of the 21st century, uh, instituted something that they call a People's Tribunal and wanted to ask those questions that the state was not asking in uh, state being the prosecutors in the NSU trial in Munich. So the NSU is a group of three Nazi terrorists that was, were killing uh, 10 people. This is the ninth of 10 murders has happened uh, in this internet cafe in Kassel in April of 2006. Um, what happened was that two of the terrorists, Nazi terrorists, entered through this door, stood here, somewhere here, we don't know exactly, but within that grid, and with a Cheska gun, with a silencer shot twice at the head of Halit Yozgat, uh, the son of the owner of this internet cafe was sitting initially like that at the counter. Uh, he fell, the chair swiveled here, his head knocked against this wall and he was found um, dead within that, more or less within that niche. So far, like any of the NSU killing uh, that has taken place um, before that. Nazi terrorists enter into small businesses run by Turkish families and, um, and, and, and shot them. The difference in this case 
is that while this whole thing was taking place, while the murder, two shots, somebody falling, knocking his head against the wall, when that was taking place, here, at all that time, a man was sitting here, um, going on a computer on a dating site. And um, when a few dozen seconds after the murder has taken place, that person logged out and went uh, out, was looking for the man that was dead, could not find him, he says, and exited uh, the cafe and uh, disappeared, heard that there was a murder, supposedly, in the newspaper later, but never reported himself to the police. Now that person was not only any person, he was a Secret Service agent of an agency called the Verfassungsschutz, whose task is to survey Nazi terror. So, something a bit strange here. So the police very politely asked this man to come back and to reenact the killing and ask him, have you really not heard the gunshot? And he says, no. Have you not seen the body as you left? He says, no. Have you not smelled the, the, the gunpowder? There's, there's such a strong smell of different chemicals inside the, the cartridge. When, when this happened, and he says, no. And he says, all right then. Fine. And the court also said, He's very believable. Now, I mean, this is a bit weird, no? And people started asking questions. And when they asked the Secret Service to provide an answer, this is what they got. 120 years ban until 2134, the Secret Service has classified the reason why that man, Andreas Temme, was in this cafe. Now, who knows what he did there? Did he actually collaborate with those Nazi terrorists? Was he set up by them? Were they his informers? And they were just trying to frame him? Uh, which would ask, lead to other questions. If they were his informer, how did he not know? Or what, 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 what kind of informers people have in their German secret services? Um, or whether he is deaf uh, and blind and... and and all those things. Uh, I mean, serious questions. But the court in Munich did not want to engage with them. The state believed him, and that man uh, is a free man, although he, he was removed, I think, more for his uh, reasons than for others. So um, luckily, and now you understand what is the necessity for counter-forensics. The necessity is, the state does not want, the state is both the alleged perpetrator, the question about them, they put a ban, they do not want to do it, somebody needs to investigate. How to investigate? There's a leak. A leak is coming out several months after the, 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 the thing gets classified, and you know thousands of documents are being put in a public domain, and images, and our team has to learn German, <laughs> which is not very easy. Uh, and then, of course, what we do, I mean, I'm not going to go through the entire investigation, but effectively, just to explain to you what we do here, we build a 3D model, because that place, conveniently, after the killing was sold off, and now is a honey shop, so you cannot really look at it. So we had to build both a digital and an abstracted and build a physical model one-to-one. -one. Who would ever allow you to build a field? Even the police doesn't have the budget to do it. The art world has the Hakave in Berlin. <laughs> so this is that, you know, our friend, you quoted Ansem. We call Ansem. Ansem, can we get a, a, a model of a shop one-to-one? -one? He says, for sure. When do you need it by? No, not exactly so easy, but the Hakave built it. It was never exhibited. Uh, this, this place, here is Christina. Uh, this place uh, was never open to the public, to only uh, some parliamentarian lawyers and uh, representative of the family uh, were there. Um, as you see, some of it is pretty close one-to-one, -one, some of it is very abstracted. Um, and within that, and now I really have to stop because the best part of this presentation is the Golden Dawn thing that Christina is going to show, so I have to speed up. Uh, we shoot a gun in Arizona, 
that's not uh, my hand though. Uh, but somebody shoots a gun in Arizona. Bolt 32 with a wet suppressor. Suppressor. Uh, with a, with a with a suppressor Unshot. or a silencer. Start. We check it in space. Now. And we verified. You would see the, this entire, the, all the results are here. Uh, the smell, um, simulation, that looks great, but actually, finally, we did not regard it as very solid evidence because we didn't know how big the door was open during the time. And every difference, slight difference in temperature and um, if the window was open or not would, would affect the sort of the cloud. But this is about the threshold of perception. This entire model was built as a sensorium, as an architectural sensorium. Perhaps if you want a kind of an inversion of phenomenology, no? The kind of phenomenology of perception, uh, how, you know, this kind of field of architectural or philosophy and then used in architectural theory of the experience of space here was translated into the threshold of perception. What's the lowest sound that could not be heard, the lowest sound that could not be the, 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 um, the, the smell and, and vision. And now here is what, what you see here is the reenactment of this agent. This is a police reenactment video. What I have to say is that here reenactment is not a representation of the crime, but the crime itself. The crime is happening right now in front of the camera in what we conceive to be perjury, i.e. a lying reenactment. He's reenacting the fact how he could have moved through space, here within that space, without smelling, seeing, uh, and hearing. Uh, we kind of uh, created here on the right, this is what he's seeing, what Andreas Temme is seeing, this is where he is. And um, we're looking for his movement. He's now pretty much where this podium is. He says, I'm looking for this guy, where is he? He's going back out there. He's looking for a wallet. His uh, 20 cents were found and he's putting it like this on the table. And this is what is within his field of vision. Right there sits the body. Here he puts the coin and he claims not to have seen it. And all state institutions agree. So here we're just getting a bit nerdy on this uh, thing. And, and here is the kind of choreography uh, of reenactment where you see uh, a member of our team uh, with a GoPro. Uh, what is on the right is what he's seeing. He's walking through, and um, you now recognize that this carpet is, in fact, the place where that crime was reenacted. And not only reenacted, where the reenactment was reenacted, right? It's the reenactment of reenact, because the reenactment itself uh, is the crime. Here he's taking the coin taking it from his pocket and putting it uh, on the desk. Okay, so what happened? Uh, nothing, it's not in court. It goes to Documenta. Um, in Documenta, the parliamentary inquiry uh, of the state of Hessen, where the place has taken place, is a parliamentary inquiry around this particular killing. Uh, the CDU, the Christian Democrats, are the ones responsible for the secret services then and now. And what they say about our investigation, what anyone's saying. This is fake. And why is it fake? Here on the CDU website, it's a documenta piece. It's an art piece. These people are not uh, entitled to speak on behalf of evidence. It's an art project. Architects and actors, left populists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, it didn't help them, and in fact, the Secret Service agent was forced to look at the very piece that will be uh, exhibited here. And in a diagram like that, we mark, I don't know, is that in the exhibition somewhere, this piece? No. Uh, so it's online. Uh, actually, it's not, it's invisible. But um, this is the, there's something that we call the uh, forensic event, that's the killing and the, and the reenactment, the two events that we investigate. And there's the event of forensic itself. The event of forensics is the way in which forensics has to 
move between forums, different forums, the top being the court, then it is denied in a circle, it is produced in a civil society form, it enters into parliamentary inquiry, goes into an art space, hear the echo in the media, the multiple forums, if we were simply forensic specialists, that line would be a single horizontal line. Thank you. This is, sorry, this is just part one. Uh, now, um, Christina, I will get you.